Hello, and thanks for joining me. One of the seminal events in my journey to atheism was the time, not long after I had taken an apologetics course in college, it was a small religious college, when I was in a Christian chat room. This was back when small religious colleges took great pride in giving their students access to the internet and made a pretty big deal out of it, and also when text chat rooms were cutting-edge technology. I was chewing the fat with my fellow Christians when, as was not infrequent, a pesky atheist came in and started being pesky. This delighted me because I had learned a number of handy arguments in my apologetics course, and one in particular struck me as a silver bullet. The logic was simply undefeatable, and for the first time I had both the opportunity and the nerve to try it out on an actual atheist. So I chuckled with confidence, cracked my knuckles, and typed out, Hey, pesky atheist, have you heard of something called Pascal's Wager? He promptly replied, yes I have, and here's what's wrong with it. The next 20 minutes of my life are kind of a blur. It's possible I even blacked out. In retrospect, my surprise came from the fact that I thought the problem with atheists was simply that they hadn't heard the arguments, that we Christians hadn't done a good job of making them well known. In fairness, at this time we were much closer to the dawn of the internet than we are today. Online apologetics certainly existed, but instead of polished YouTube videos and blogs and live streams, think websites on places like GeoCities with hand-coded HTML and text in Comic Sans and highly pixelated banners on the top and bottom, and web rings. Anybody here remember web rings? I thought apologetics was just getting off the ground, and that the only problem with Blaise Pascal was that nobody had heard about him except a few college professors who were passing it on to us so that we could pass it on to others. But the atheists were one step ahead of the Christians. And even though the sheer numbers of Christians has guaranteed that apologetics has a much larger internet presence than counter-apologetics, they have not been able to make the arguments any better. More polished, certainly. Old Earth creationism became intelligent design, for instance. And the watchmaker analogy gave way to irreducible complexity. But not any better. Pascal's wager in particular has not gotten any better. The simplest form of the argument is a decision matrix. If God exists and you're a Christian, you gain infinite reward. If God exists and you are not a Christian, you suffer infinite punishment. If God does not exist and you're a Christian, nothing happens. And if God doesn't exist and you're not a Christian, again, nothing happens. So, since the range of outcomes for being a Christian is between infinite reward and nothing, and since the range of outcomes for not being a Christian is between nothing and infinite punishment, it's clearly more advantageous and therefore more rational to be a Christian. And, it is argued, since the potential reward and punishment is infinite, this logic holds regardless of how low the probability is that God actually exists, as long as the probability isn't zero. The most obvious problem with the wager, and the first one that was pointed out to me by the pesky atheist in the chat room, is the possibility of other gods existing. As I recall, this possibility did come up in the apologetics course where I first learned of Pascal's wager, for about 20 seconds. I don't recall whether the instructor brought it up or whether one of the students brought it up, but the instructor said, so it might be objected that the same wager applies to, say, Allah, but first of all, does anyone here think that Allah might exist? No? Then there's not much point in worrying about it, is there? And second, and more importantly, the point of the wager is simply to show that God, a God, some God, exists. Once we've established that, we can turn to which God it is that exists, and for that, we look at arguments like the resurrection. I accepted this response at the time, and those apologists who still employ the wager accept it as well. But it doesn't work. Look at it as a 3x3 three three decision matrix. If God, the Christian God, exists, then atheists and Muslims go to hell, and Christians go to heaven. If Allah exists, then atheists and Christians go to hell, and Muslims go to heaven. If God doesn't exist, then it doesn't matter what we believe, nothing happens. Assuming the probability of God is the same as the probability of Allah, the two possibilities cancel each other out, and the only thing to consider is the positive or negative utility of what you believe to this life. But even if the probabilities are unequal, even if it is massively more likely that the Christian God exists than that Allah exists, it doesn't matter as far as the wager is concerned, because any finite non-zero number multiplied by infinity becomes infinity. If the potential reward or punishment is infinite, then it doesn't matter how unlikely it is. It's also possible that there exists a being, Michael Martin in his discussion of the wager referred to him as the perverse master, who does infinite punishment to anyone who believes in the existence of any god, including himself, 
and infinite reward to atheists. The perverse master might be vanishingly unlikely, but it is not impossible. For any possible being whose existence rewards a certain belief and punishes another, there is another possible being whose existence punishes the one and rewards the other. This infinite array of possibilities cancels itself out completely. And again, we are left with only the utility of what you believe to this life to consider. Let's consider the other thing my instructor said, that the purpose of the wager is only to move someone from atheism to theism, and once that is accomplished, we can consider which God exists by appealing to evidential arguments. But if that evidence is sufficient to move someone from a general, non-specific sort of theism to, say, Christianity, then it ought to be sufficient to move someone from atheism to Christianity. There's no reason why the argument from the resurrection would be convincing to a generic theist who believes that a god does exist, but unconvincing to an atheist who accepts that a god might exist. Assuming both were rational and used the same methodology to evaluate the argument, they would both give it X amount of weight as evidence for the existence of the Christian god. And presumably, if that weight exceeds a certain threshold in their mind, then that person will believe that the Christian god exists. The only thing to be said for starting from generic theism rather than atheism is that for a generic theist, that threshold for belief might be significantly lower. So this means the proponent of Pascal's wager is making a startling admission. He is admitting that whatever his logical and evidential arguments for the existence of God, they are possibly not enough by themselves to convince a reasonable person that God exists unless that person already believes that some God exists. Otherwise, he would not bother with the wager. The Pascalian admits that the evidence for God is, at best, less than compelling. But I think that if we're going to accept such an extraordinary claim, and whether the Christian likes it or not, the claim that God exists is epistemically quite extraordinary. And if we're going to base our laws and traditions around such a proposition, then I think the evidence ought to be compelling. Don't you? So far, I've considered the multiple gods objection as involving tension between Christianity and other religions. But there are differences in the reward and punishment conditions even within Christianity. The requirements for salvation differ between sects, sometimes wildly, as do the exact conceptions of heaven and hell. To Lutherans and Baptists, heaven is eternal bliss, while hell is the literal, physical torture more or less described by Dante in the Inferno. Other sects, such as the Church of Christ, liberal Methodist gatherings, and, as of July 28, 1999, the Roman Catholic Church, teach hell to be simply a separation from God. It is left ill-defined beyond that, but there's nothing to indicate torture. Think about this. If the mafia is threatening to harm you if you don't pay the money, then you have a strong pragmatic reason to pay the money. But if Johnny is threatening to break your legs if you don't drop the money off at Maple Street, while Joey is threatening to outright kill you if you don't drop it off at Elm Street, then even though you're obeying the mob either way, you have a strong incentive to go with Elm Street rather than Maple. Similarly, if you accept the logic of the wager, then you have a strong incentive to be a Baptist rather than a Methodist. So why do we not see interdenominational deployments of the wager? Can you even imagine such a thing? Imagine if Baptists showed up outside Catholic churches with turn or burn signs. It would be the exact same logic of the wager, and yet it would absolutely expose the, for want of a better word, mafia-ness of the whole thing. And then there's the idea that any god worthy of the title must save everyone. A good friend of mine, and also one of my in-laws, is actually a member of the clergy. And here's something she said in a recent sermon. Jesus is the path to our creator because he perfectly shows us God's love. It's our job to reflect that to the world. Jesus welcomes us into heaven, but he's not the border patrol standing there checking IDs. He's the first hug of many that you get there before you're greeted by everyone. You know, atheists are routinely accused of, in Craig's words, loving darkness rather than light and wanting nothing to do with God. But frankly, when it comes to the kind of God that my in-law describes, my only complaint about him is that he happens to not exist. I've said in the past that when it comes to the question of who gets saved and who gets damned in Christianity, I'm a prime directive kind of guy. I view this as an internal matter to Christianity, and I stay out of it. But if this first hug of many theology were made universal among self-identified Christians, I think the Western world would improve by at least an order of magnitude. Anyway, the idea of universal salvation is another row to add to the decision matrix, another factor to consider. 
and it's especially damaging to Pascal's wager when we consider that one of the key assumptions of the wager is that it's not impossible that God exists. When it comes to the exclusivist God of the wager, the God who saves only those who believe, the attribute of being exclusivist seems to me to contradict another attribute of God, that of being worthy of worship. So, like a square circle, it is indeed impossible for God to exist. While writing the script for this video, I learned that George H. Smith, political activist and author of the classic Atheism, The Case Against God, passed away earlier this year at the age of 73. I'd like to finish this video by putting forth the counter wager he once offered in response to Pascal's wager. He called it, appropriately enough, Smith's wager. Smith's wager, and I'm putting all this in my own terms, states that there are three possibilities. First, that God does not exist, or that if God does exist, he is the God of deism, a God totally unconcerned with human affairs. Second, that God exists and is a just God. Third, that God exists and is an unjust God. If a personal God does not exist, then it doesn't matter what you believe. There's no reward or punishment either way. If God exists and is just, then again, it doesn't matter what you believe. Such a God would not punish a good person for having the wrong religion. Indeed, a just God would not inflict a disproportional, much less infinite punishment on anyone for any reason. That's what it means to be just. Of course, some Christians will say that by stealing a cookie from the cookie jar when we are six, we are deserving of infinite punishment. This is one of those propositions which, notwithstanding its being taken seriously by many theologians, is deserving only of being laughed out of the room with no further discussion. But this brings me to Smith's third option, that God exists and is unjust. Such a God, and only such a God, might indeed decide that we are all deserving of infinite punishment, and only by doing X, Y, and Z can we attain his mercy. Atheists would indeed be in trouble if such a God existed, but what makes Christians believe they will be any better off? Because God said so? Why should an unjust God's word be trusted? What's to stop an unjust God from convincing believers that they and only they will be saved, and also that everything he promises is trustworthy, and then turning around and torturing everyone forever anyway, just for the hell of it, so to speak? If an unjust God exists, then none of his promises can be trusted. None of his covenants can be relied upon. And the only appropriate entry for both atheists and theists in the decision matrix is a big fat question mark. The only way to avoid this is to assume that God is just, which means he won't punish a good person for having the wrong religion. If I had a magical mailbox that could send messages through time, yes, like in the movie, and I could send one letter to the David John Wellman of Mumblecough years ago, back when I thought the wager was a good bet, well, obviously I'd send myself some stock market tips. I mean, duh, wouldn't you? But if I could send two letters to my past self, the other would be the things that I've said in this video. If you enjoyed this video and want to help my channel grow, please hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. Be sure to hit the bell to be notified when a new video comes out. And if you want to share what you would bet on, your own intellectual integrity, or the nebulous promises of Christian evangelists, leave a comment below. A huge thanks to all my Patreon supporters. You help make this channel possible. If you'd like to become a supporter, check out the link in the description. Thanks as always for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. I'm David John Wellman, and the rest is up to you.